Why Children Quit Music, my upcoming book in 2019, lays out the exact causes for why children stop learning music due to the state of music education and shows how to bring back the love of learning music again. If you're a fan of the show, consider becoming a supporting listener on Patreon for exclusive perks, goodies, and access to our private Facebook group. Also, don't forget to join my mailing list on NikhilHogan.com to get access to updates on the book and free upcoming music tutorial ebooks. Now, on to the show. On today's show, I talk to Grammy Award winning New Age composer Paul F. Gerinos about his music development as a youth, graduating from the Peabody University with a full scholarship as a bass violinist, his influences in New Age music, his compositional process, his production setup, and so much more. Stay tuned, you're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show, the show bringing you the world's best musicians and deepest conversations about music. I am so delighted today to introduce my guest, Grammy award-winning composer, producer and musician Paul F. Gerinos. A major figure in the field of New Age music, Avgerinos has recorded over 24 CDs in the New Age genre. In 2014, his album Bhakti received a Grammy nomination for Best New Age Album. In 2015, Avgerinos' album Grace won the Grammy for Best New Age Album. As a composer, Avgerinos has also worked on over 100 film, television, and cable projects for HBO, PBS, and Lifetime, among others. His most recent album releases include 2016's Ama, Devotional Songs to the Divine Mother, 2017's Home, Where Everyone is Welcome, a collaboration with Deepak Chopra and Kabir Segal, and 2018's Mindfulness. Paul, such a pleasure to have you on the show for the first time. Oh, thank you very much, Nikhil. It's wonderful to be able to speak with you. Other interviewers have done an admirable job of exploring your overall philosophy towards music and life. I'm very curious about the nuts and bolts of the music. I believe there's a lot unsaid about your craft and method, which is why I'm so thrilled to be able to talk to you today. Allow me the opportunity to delve into your past as a musician. So how old were you when you first started music? Well, that was back in the early 70s. I was probably about 11, 12 when I started getting serious about music. And uh, by the mid-70s, I started getting very excited about electronic music because that was a, a, a brand new field at that time. You know, synthesizers were being made by Moog and Putney. And um, I was lucky enough to have a, a small synthesizer in my high school where I went to Wilton High School, the music department had the resources to buy a, a little Putney synthesizer from England. And I spent a lot of time with that little Putney. I was fascinated <laughs> by the possibilities of electronic music. And of course, the words uh, New Age music were, were not in our vocabulary yet. And um, uh, electronic music was real considered an oddity and a kind of a a side thing. You know, who knew that it was going to become the heart of popular music in uh, right. a mere... 20 years. <laughs> uh, Paul, do you have perfect pitch? No, I don't, Nikhil. I, I have a fairly good sense of relative uh, relationships. I can usually guess, uh, you know, like by comparing it to my lowest note I can sing or some reference point. I can usually get close, but I don't have that particular uh, gift. Prior to the age of 11 and 12, were you doing anything musical? Did you have a private piano teacher or private uh, trumpet teacher? No, I didn't. I, I, I took some trumpet lessons through the school and um, fooled around with my aunt's guitar and my mother's piano. But I wasn't really, I wasn't one of those kids, you know, who started piano at four years old. Right. And, you know, all that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely not one of those kids. <laughs> what records did you listen to as a child and teenager growing up? And what music was important to you as a child? Right. Well, you know, the all-powerful adolescence, which raises its head in a, you know, in a boy's life around 12, 13, you know, with all kinds of frightening emotions and uh, 
adrenaline and testosterone coursing through our bodies. Uh, that was pretty intense. And you know, I found that music was a, a balance for that. It helped me to process my emotions. And, uh, you know, I, like a lot of kids, musical kids, I had rock bands. I played in, I played bass in rock bands and I sang. And, but by the time I got to about, about 15 or so, I discovered yoga and spirituality and then I discovered John McLaughlin and the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Ah, that's right. Let me read a quote of yours that you've said about John McLaughlin. You said, one of the artists that really took me to a whole other level was Mahavishnu John McLaughlin, who I heard when I was 16. At first, I was just dumbfounded. I couldn't even understand what he was doing. <laughs> but it's, it just seemed so complicated and sophisticated but of course, I grew into it, and he's one of the main reasons why I went to music professionally. Yeah, it's very true. It was one of those experiences that you can say is truly transformational. You know, like uh, it just blew my mind. I remember I was in a, a regular rock band rehearsal, and my friend, one of my guitar player friends, brought over this this record, this vinyl record of the Inner Mounting Flame by. John McLaughlin, Mahavishnu Orchestra, and he puts it on. He says, "Paul, listen to this," and he puts it on. <laughs> and my, you know, and my first reaction was like, "What is this?" It's like I couldn't even. Is this music, or you know, it's like it was just so bizarre and so, you know, like from another world. It was like he brought it from an alien spaceship. You know, <laughs> it, it just, it just. <laughs> and of course, my first reaction, I was kind of, you know, I was intimidated. I was like, "What is he doing?" It's all these complicated chords and rhythms and. And oh my God, listen to him play that guitar. I've never heard anybody play the guitar with that kind of skill. And, uh, <laughs> you know, next thing you know, we decided to form a Mahavishnu Orchestra tribute band. And we, started, <laughs> we, we, we actually learned their songs, you know, and we were playing them at the local high school dances. Of course, the kids were like, what is this? <laughs> you know, they were like, like, we can't dance to this. So that's equal, that didn't go over too well with our now, public. Wait, but- wait a second, Paul. At, at 15 or 16, just the attempt to play something like that is is shows that you were at some pretty decent level as a musician. So how did you, did, were you completely self-taught? Or did you have a teacher that kind of taught you the theory of how to put songs together and form and that kind of thing? No, I really didn't have any uh, serious uh, teaching until I got to Peabody Conservatory about when I was 18 or so. Um, I had a few private teachers to help me learn a little bit about the bass, uh, the bass violin, the electric bass, the the trumpet. But I didn't really have, you know, a really serious uh, uh, tutorial in music. It's mostly mostly self-taught. You know, I just uh, I, I gravitated towards things that excited me like Mahavishnu and I would just learn you know just by practicing I would unpack it and figure out well, what notes is he playing what chords is he playing so you'd sit down and try and transcribe it by ear oh yeah yeah we we play it on a tape recorder at half speed you know so we could <laughs> we could learn it note by note and and of course, I had help from my friends in the band who would say, oh, oh, I can show you how to play that chord. This is where you put your fingers. And I was like, whoa, that's a lot of notes in that chord. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so fascinated by how organic it was for you and how self-directed. That's really fascinating. Well, yeah, the, the important takeaway, Nikhil, is that it was uh, one in the same with my spiritual exploration. In other words, I was very excited about learning about spirituality and studying Hinduism and yoga. And I, I became a devotee of an Indian guru, the same guru of McLaughlin. That's uh, right. Chinboy. There's an amazing story where you actually bumped into that person right in your home state. Yeah, it was amazing. It was just meant to be that every week Sri Chinmoy would come to Norwalk. He was living in Queens, New York, and he would come to Norwalk, Connecticut, which was literally, you know, five miles from where I was growing up. So I could go and visit him. It's just, it was meant to be. And so my excitement about music and my spiritual awakening were really one and the same to me. I looked at music as my spiritual sadhana, my practice, you know, a part of my practice besides yoga and meditation and prayer. But it was a big part of my, my spiritual awakening was learning how to make 
sophisticated, spiritually powerful music that would affect people's vibration level. So, you know, the two were hand in hand. I really, I didn't separate them in my mind, like, oh, this is spirituality and this is music. I was really only interested in music that had spiritual power. And I was, you know, it was a big part of my path. It was, in other words, I was, I was discovering my dharma, my purpose in life. How did that lead you then to enrolling in the Peabody Institute of the John Hopkins University? Well, I was playing rock and roll, and then once I discovered McLaughlin, I was playing jazz, rock fusion, and all that. But I quickly burnt out on the rock music and the pop music, and I just decided, yeah, that's not going to go anywhere for me spiritually. And... I didn't feel like I was drawn to live a life in, in the jazz rock fusion like uh, Mahavishnu John McLaughlin was doing. And so my heart told me that if I wanted to be a truly competent musician and composer and producer, I needed to get some real training. And so I thought, well, where where's a good place to get some real training? The classical world, because, you know, you have that whole history stretching back four or five hundred years. You study Palestrina and medieval music and uh, the Renaissance and the Baroque and the classical and the Romantic and the Impressionistic. And so, you know, my heart told me, you need to get some real training. You know, you know, you know a little bit, but you're not fully, you're not well-rounded. You know, you really don't know <laughs> very much. You're just, you're just kind of going on bits and pieces. Now, you were a full scholarship honor student at Peabody? Yeah, well, that's another miraculous story that it was just meant to be. So this is a funny story, Nikhil. This is a true and funny story. <laughs> so, you know, also my mother was saying, like, you know, I was a little bit listless. You know, I was 17, graduated high school. I wasn't really sure what to do. So my mother said, well, you've got to do something. So I said, well, there's this bass violin teacher. I was already starting my classical studies in bass violin. And he, he, he lives in... Um, Puerto Rico in San Juan. He teaches at the Casals Institute there in, in Puerto Rico. And he's invited me to go down there. So how about I go down there and study bass with him? And it's just like, well, you know, I don't know, this sounds crazy, but you, you know, you got to do something. <laughs> so, so I went down there and I studied with him. He didn't speak a lick of English. <laughs> and my Spanish was not very good, but I was learning. I was, I was, I did learn some very important things about process and about self-discipline and how to teach yourself, which is really what classical training is all about. So teach you how to teach yourself. Were you a good sight reader at the time? Were you able to read pretty comfortably? Yeah, I was I was, you know, I was okay. I was pretty good. I was getting along, but I was a little bit cocky. I was playing pieces that were too advanced and my technique wasn't solid enough. So he, he kind of did a boot camp where he broke me down. He said, look, you got to, you know, you've got to correct your technical, your technique errors so that when you go to play the harder pieces, you play them with confidence and with the uh, strength of technique. And, and what pieces are we talking about here? Oh, the hardest pieces for bass violin, like the Bottazzini uh, Concerto in B minor, the very hardest things. I was, you know, trying to showboat them, and I was playing them basically on adrenaline and bravura. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, my technique wasn't really up to it, but I was just doing it. You know, I was playing them with passion, you know, and I, I, I could play a lot of it well, but not all of it because my technique wasn't up to the to the task. I was cheating, you know, I was just kind of making up tricks to try to play the most difficult pieces. So after about a, a season there, I realized, okay, I've got to go to a big mainstream conservatory if I want to continue. At that point, my goal was to be a principal bass of a major symphony orchestra. So I said, well, you've got to get to a better school. So I sent out from Puerto Rico, I made a little recording of me playing the bass violin with this with this nice lady playing the harpsichord. <laughs> and you could hear the crickets chirping outside in the window. It was very magical, you know, <laughs> I made a quarter inch tape recording of me playing. And I sent the tape to uh, Indiana University uh, Hart School of Music, because Gary Carr uh, taught there. He was, uh, you know, the great virtuoso bassist taught there at the time. And I sent it to Peabody. And the answer came back. They all accepted me, but only Peabody offered the scholarship. 
and which I needed because we didn't have any money. My father was like, you know, well, if you want to go to music school, you're going to have to figure that out because, you know, this is, uh, you know, my father's an engineer. It seemed very frivolous to him. So Peabody came back with, we're going to give you this huge scholarship. And we always thought that maybe they thought I was from Puerto Rico and they were fulfilling a minority <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> uh, you know, but there you go. I mean, what a strange, circuitous path. But that's the way the divine works. It's like we're all brought where we need to go one way or another. So, <laughs> And so can you describe your conservatory days? Were you majoring in performance because you mentioned that you wanted to be a principal bass player? Yeah, I was. I focused on performance. That was my goal. It was very simple. I wanted to become the principal bass of a major symphony orchestra. And I, I focused on that and I worked very hard and I did lots of gigs while I was in conservatory. I was working every week at several different gigs. I sang in a paid choir. I played in the opera company. I played in the Baltimore symphony. I played in the theater company. I played at the jazz club dance with electric bass. I played in rock parties with the electric bass. You know, I just worked really hard and before I even graduated, I was offered principal bass of the Hong Kong Philharmonic. And so I left in my in my spring of my senior year to go join that orchestra in 1980. So you traveled to Hong Kong? Yeah, I was offered the job there. That was my goal, principal bass of a major world symphony orchestra. And so, you know, God, God gives us where our, our heart, if our desire is pure and strong, manifestation happens you know it's uh i was 100 percent focused on that goal you know other kids were going to parties and having fun <laughs> and they dating and stuff but no i was just this is my goal i'm going to achieve this goal and so it manifested before i even graduated school now i wanted to ask you paul throughout this entire time when did you start composing you, you studied theory, I suppose, in, in Peabody, and did that inform compositionally your development? It did. I, I, yes, the Peabody was, is wonderful because there's four years of music history and four years of music theory for everyone, no matter what your major. And so it was very illuminating. And I started composing at Peabody. I wrote, you know, by hand. I started writing like little quartets and quintets and little pieces. And I wasn't very good at it for sure, but I was developing the um, vocabulary and I was developing the knowledge of the history of music so that when I finally you know, went to do the music I cared about, which was healing, gentle, uplifting New Age music, I had all that depth of knowledge, you know, and, and I could think of, oh, well, look at those pretty chords that Debussy used or Ravel used, or look at how Palestrina wrote these magnificent flowing uh, polyphonies, the counterpoint, you know? So, I mean, for someone like me, it was just uh, probably the biggest, uh, one of the biggest growth periods in my life. I just learned so much. You know, at a school like that, there's so many kids that are amazingly talented, so much more talented than me and so much more gifted. And and that's very inspiring, you know. It, it, uh, it makes you allow, helps you to grow much more quickly because you have such a, uh, such a rich environment. Now, you were a principal bass player, but with composition, did you use piano as well to help you compose? Yeah, in the beginning, I just wrote for whatever instruments uh, seemed appealing at the time and, and small forces because then I could get them performed. Like, you know, if I wrote a woodwind quintet, I could I could corral some kids to play it, you know, so I could actually hear it. You know, if you if you write a full orchestral score, it's still harder to convince the orchestra to come together for Paul's orchestra score. They're like, well, no, actually, we're playing Beethoven and Brahms and uh, Rachmaninoff today. We don't have any time for Paul. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've had really a great career as a principal bass player. You played with uh, Isaac Stern, Jean-Pierre Rampal, the Beau Arts Trio, Bereshnikov. Just any interesting anecdotes you want to share before we jump to another topic? 
Well, it was a funny time with uh, Isaac Stern once. We were playing, uh, he was playing um, a Mozart violin concerto with the Annapolis Symphony, and I was uh, principal bass of that. That was when I was at Peabody. And um, this young man brazenly came up to the front with his camera and started, in the middle of the performance, he started snapping pictures <laughs> of Isaac Stern playing the, the solo violin. And Isaac just stopped the whole performance in the middle in the middle of a bow stroke. And he pointed at the kid. He says, "You leave." And the kid just, you know, the kid just bow, bent over and he shuffled out of the auditorium. And then he turned to um, the conductor, was uh, the pianist. Um, he said, "Maestro, from the top." So we went back to the beginning and we started over again. <laughs> That was funny. <laughs> now you, this led you to popular music as well because you've performed with Charles Aznavour, Liza Minnelli, even Buddy Rich. How did you start performing with these more popular acts? Well, it's interesting that um, after a few years in the orchestra, I had another transformation where I was having trouble seeing myself staying there for the rest of my life, which was very strange because, you know, I was, I had such a strong desire to get there. But then once I got there, I thought I was starting to feel like, well, I don't know if this is it. I think I'm, I'm destined to do something else. And so, and so when I started to uh, slow that world down and leave that world, I had to do something. And so uh, I was introduced to a, a wonderful friend in New York, Bob Cranshaw is a great bass player. He was the first music director of Saturday Night Live and he's, he's played on like a thousand Blue Note records and Ornette Coleman and all those great guys and he's a sweet fellow and he likes helping young players and he, I went to him and without even hearing me play, he said, well, Buddy needs a bass player tomorrow, so go down to uh, <laughs> such and such and he'll get on the bus and go play with Buddy at Princeton. And I was like, Buddy Rich? He said, yeah, yeah, he's kind of intense, but, you know, just, <laughs> 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 you know, and then another time he said, well, this this French singer, Charles Aznavour, he's doing a tour of the U.S. and I can't go. So why don't you go? You go to Los Angeles next week and they'll, they'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, again, well, can you talk about like, the talk about the Buddy Rich gig? How did that go? Uh, that was not one of my finest moments, I have to say. He, he's uh, pretty intense to play to play for. And uh, of course, I was I heard all the stories about how hard it was to keep up with him so i was a little scared going in but you know it, it was uh it was i did the best i could you know and uh i think if i'd been a little older and more mature i think i would have been able i would have handled it better but you know it was great to get to play with him it was amazing were you familiar with that swing style uh, versus the classical training that you've had yeah, I was blessed that growing up uh, seventh grade through 12th grade, we had a big band program in our school. Because my older brother, four years older, had started the big band program in our Wilton, in the Wilton school system. So when I got there, I, I was able to play for six years, big band. So by the time I graduated high school, I could, you know, walk into a big band job as a bass player without any problem. Yeah, because I'd been doing it for six years. So... But that's because of my older brother, George. If you know, he started that program, him and a friend convinced the band director, he said, you know, let's start a big band. And the director was like, oh, okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so my brother, he got the music together, he got brought the musicians, you know, and they all learned how to do it and they learned how to play How High the Moon and all the rest of it. And how was the experience with Charles Aznavour? Oh, that was that was really great. I mean, he was very generous. He was like a second father to me. He was very generous and kind, and uh, he paid us well. He took good care of us. We had a wonderful tours all over the place, all over the world, actually. And um, he moved near me while I was still working for him. He was living in L.A., and then at some point he moved to Greenwich, Connecticut. It was right down the road from me. And uh, so I would go visit him, and he teach me about songwriting and work ethic of being a composer. And that was really inspiring to see him. Every morning he'd get up and write a song. 
at 6 a.m., whether he wanted to or not, every day he would write a song. And he said, Paul, you see, if you write a song every day, you're going to write a few hit songs eventually. It's like monkeys, t- you know, eventually going to type Shakespeare. <laughs> 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 and, and he's right. I've, I've told all my, 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 you know, people that I mentor, my clients, my young students and stuff. I say, you know, you got to show up. You have to have a work ethic. If you want to write great songs, you got to write them every day. And then eventually some of those songs will be great. It's just going to happen. But you can't sit down and say, oh, I'm going to write a great song or a great composition. You have to write all the time. And then the universe will decide what's great and what's not so great. You know, like all of us in this world, we have that experience where, you know, we work really hard on this project and then we work less hard on this other project. And the project we work less hard on becomes more successful, much more <laughs> successful, because there's something in it. Yeah, some kind of magical moment happened that connects with the people. And so you just have to show up and do the work because you don't know which project is going to be the most successful. It's a, it's a mysterious process. Now, I'm trying to get a timeline here. So you built a studio, Studio Unicorn, in 1984. And where does that position itself according to your performances after your graduation? Right. So it was basically, you know, a classical orchestra, and then that died down. And then I was doing like pop and jazz uh, to earn a living. And then I was like, well, what I really want to do is do this new age music and produce my own music. So I need a recording studio to do that. So I built a little basement studio, but I kept playing gigs, you know, to pay the bills. I would keep playing whatever gigs I could get my hands on and doing a little teaching until the studio got successful enough that eventually I could stop doing gigs and stop doing teaching. And that took till about, oh, the year 2000, right. you know, by about, yeah, by about 2000, the studio was cooking pretty well. I, you know, it's was getting a lot of clients and done a lot of new age albums and it was starting to come together. So I stopped all the gigging. Cause that, you know, it was never my, it was never my long-term goal. My goal was to, you know, the, the original goal was to do this healing new age music, you know, back in 74, I wanted to do that, but there wasn't a way to do it because, first of all, the genre didn't exist yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but, but, but in the 80s, you know, by the middle of the 80s, it started becoming a, a genre, became a thing. I remember when I started my studio, one of my clients was a, a cassette duplicator. You know, you used to have those, uh, those audio cassettes, analog tape, right? And so... Uh, I was working for him, and um, one of his clients said, hey, do you want to do some new age albums for us? We need uh, we need more albums. And I said, oh, I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so again, it was just meant to be, right? And that was New World Productions from England, and they had a branch here in Connecticut. So it was called New Age Music at the time, or what was the – Yeah, in, well, the middle of the 80s, it started becoming um, – a, a, a phrase new age music became like a genre and the new age the first new age grammy was given in um i guess it was 86 yeah and um so it was becoming a, a known thing it was like a scene that you could get involved in and so i did uh four cassette tape albums for this uh new world productions and you know they they weren't really very great there's some nice moments in there but you know i was just starting and and that's how we grow is by, you know, you have to make an album and then hear it later and go, well, you know, this was good, but I could do this part better. And so you take the good and hopefully grow forward with the um, with what you learn from each project. Now, you're a multi-instrumentalist. You play keyboards, you're trained on the bass, but you play guitar as well. How many instruments do you play and how did you pick them up? And also, how familiar are you with playing Eastern instruments, which seem to be very popular on New Age recordings? Well, I think I'm most comfortable with strings. You know, anything that has strings on it, like uh, guitars, basses, um, lutes, uh, sitars, drones, um, santours, sarangis, you know, anything with strings, I just feel like a tactile connection because I can touch the string 
and pluck it or bow it. So it's very visceral. Whereas, you know, piano is a little more cerebral because, you know, you're doing different things with each hand. So I can play piano. I'm okay. But things with strings, I can really, my soul can come through like a cello. I can pick it up and make a beautiful sound. I may not be able to play, you know, a great cello concerto, but I can make a beautiful, simple melody. So, you know, it's about following your heart with instruments. You know, I'm not very drawn. I can play the flute, the oboe, the clarinet, the saxophone, but I'm not drawn to it, you know? So I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't have the desire to play them. I've always, always been very drawn to string instruments the most. And of course, of course, the electronics, for me, the whole world of electronics in music, you know, Pro Tools and plugins and virtual instruments and synthesizers, software synthesizers and hardware synthesizers, to me, that's a whole world that I cherish because there, you can achieve high levels of richness and complexity by, you know, playing, like for instance, if you play eight or nine different synthesizers with the same chords, you can develop a very rich texture that's, uh, to me, is as satisfying as any orchestral layering. So, and that's, that all, that excitement started back in the 70s, even though, you know, the synthesizers were very crude and primitive in the 70s. I could see the possibility I, I could see it that if you layered these together in the right way, you know, like we, we heard switched on Bach, you know, Wendy Carlos, and we were like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. You know, listen to these sounds. I wanted to ask you that, Paul. So what for people who don't know, what are some really influential albums that really shape the direction of the music? Well, yeah, there's two that jump to mind. Uh, Switched on Bach by uh, at that name at that time it was Walter Carlos and now Wendy Carlos but that that's a seminal album I think it came out in '69 or so and it just shook the world of music and musicians and people like me a very young and impressionable were just very blown away by that album <laughs> we we were like oh my god this is so cool how did he do this. You know, and it was an amazing accomplishment because it was a monophonic synth. It could only play one note at a time. You had to tune it every 30 seconds because it kept going out of tune. And you had to fuss <laughs> with it day and night. And he recorded it all on tape recorders. So it's it's just monumental. So the album, just for my listeners, it's an album. It's a collection of pieces by J.S. Bach performed by Carlos and Benjamin Folkman on a Moog synthesizer. And yeah. it, it was pretty famous in bringing synthesizers to popular music. Yeah, it, it really, it shook, it just, uh, there are many people like me who are active now who were so inspired by that album. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we, you know, we were like, did you hear that? It's like, oh my God, how did he do that? That's so cool. You know, because especially for people that are studying classical music and are interested in electronics, we were like, oh my gosh. You know, because the precision and the clarity that he brought out to this, you know, the amazing compositions of Bach, which are so meticulous and so mathematically perfect, it was a great match, right? Because the clarity and precision of the electronics, it brought out the divine brilliance of, of the great... Bach compositions even more for me because of the precision. You know, when you hear a Brandenburg Concerto played by a, you know, a great chamber orchestra, it's very beautiful. But there are some aspects of it that are actually still a little sloppy <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, because the music is really, really hard. You know, Bach wrote, he wasn't concerned about whether you could play it or not. <laughs> <laughs> When, when he wrote the well-tempered clavier, he wasn't thinking like, oh, I should dumb it down a little here because this is going to be hard for Paul to play. No, he, was, he was going the other way. He was saying, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, 
this music, I'm just, God is giving me this music. I'm just writing it down. Well, Bach was a very devout person himself. He has a lot of dedications to God on a, a lot of the manuscripts. Oh, yeah. He was a great, great soul. And, uh, and while having like 15 kids, too. Yeah. I mean, he was just amazing, <laughs> completely amazing yeah. human being. I mean, it's just... Uh, I'm actually going to ask you later about your favorite composers. But you mentioned there was a second recording that was pretty important. Yeah, there was a Tomita did an album called Snowflakes Are Dancing, which uh, explored the world of Debussy and impressionistic composers with uh, the ARP 2600 with the with the electronic music and that came after uh, Carlos's seminal work. But because he was exploring the impressionistic music, that really sparked my connection to New Age because you know. New Age has its roots in the impressionistic music of a hundred years ago because, you know, Ravel and Debussy right. and Satie. Yeah, you know, with gentle. Very mood like. Yeah. yeah, moody, dreamy. That whole vibe that they were exploring became a bedrock for a starting point, you know, for our work. And so. When I heard the Debussy done with electronics, I thought, oh, wow, this is this is very powerful to me. It really moved me. And so I listened to that record endlessly uh, when I especially when I was in Hong Kong. I remember that it was one of my favorite recordings when I was working in the orchestra. What did your colleagues think of all these reinterpreted classical pieces? It must have been controversial right at the time. Yeah, it was Nikhil. Some people hated it, and they were very vocal about it. <laughs> my, my, my mother didn't like it. She was like, that electronic music is too cold, it's too clinical, and, you know, it's, music is an art. It's, it's subjective at the end of the day. One person's uh, treasure can be another person's junk. It's, uh, you know, that's one of the beauties of, uh, of the arts is that there's something for everyone, you know, and... Uh, um, and, you know, our feelings change over time. I, I don't listen to those albums uh, now like I did then. Um, I listen to different stuff now. So, you know, I think as we go through life, our tastes change. And, you know, that's a beautiful, beautiful aspect. Sometimes a music, I, I call it cathartic music, like, uh, like Mahavishnu's music and uh, Switched On Bach. For me, those were cathartic albums, which... They just uh, took me to a whole new place and opened up my mind and, and opened up my heart. And, you know, it, it was only for a few years that I was deeply engrossed in those albums, but it changed me. You know, it opened me up to possibilities. And so I, I call that cathartic music. I think all of us in, in this, uh, all of us in the music world, we have those cathartic albums, you know, that they just it's just like a sea change you know you can remember oh i was i'm not i wasn't the same person after i experienced that i'm very interested now in your compositional method let me read you a quote of yours you said on a more practical level i have great patience and focus the ability to work on the same three minutes of music for 10 hours straight without losing the focus of classical perfection. I have been known to spend weeks on the same piece of music. This would drive most people crazy, but for me, it is my spiritual path and fulfillment. Give an example of like working on something for just endlessly, just shaping it and perfecting it. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's a big part of my process because my music is very simple theoretically. It's a few chords, some rhythms, some melodies, you know, the, the actual elements are very simple. But what I spend the time on is levels of nuance, shadings of color. Um, how well can I blend this shaker with the sound of this drone or, you know, so for me, it's all about painting with sound, painting with texture and that takes a lot of patience. So right now I'm working on a, um, a um, devotional album for this year. One of my projects this year will come out in the fall. Uh, we'll have uh, Krishna Das singing on it and um, Wah and 
uh, Donna DeLore and maybe even Diva Primal. And so I'm working on the tracks right now, making the foundations. You know, yesterday I was working on one piece for about 10 hours. And, uh, you know, I spent about an hour fussing with one particular keyboard sound because I was trying to get just the right texture to go with this particular piece. And then once I got that, then of course I'm still fussing with the chords, you know, and the right performance of them and the right positioning, you know, because each step leads to the next one. It's like a puzzle, you know, and once you get one piece to fit in well, then it helps you figure out what the next piece will be. It's very methodical and and uh, you have to have a lot of faith because when you start out, you know, there's nothing. It's just a blank slate, you know. <laughs> That's, you know, it's so fascinating because when I listened to Grace and I was listening to it and enjoying it, and I was thinking to myself, there's a lot actually really going on. Every second is calculated. The production, I believe, is so is incredibly complicated. Let me read another quote of yours. You said, I am a created in the studio kind of guy for the most part. I love the spontaneity and magical synchronicity of the studio environment. So many wonderful tools and instruments to inspire and explore. Now, what are these tools? Do you use Pro Tools? What are the things that you use a lot? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, nowadays it's uh, it's Pro Tools and it's uh, it's the virtual synthesizer plugins and the effect processing plugins. In the old days, it was a lot of outboard, you know, rack mounted synthesizers, uh, hardware synthesizers, which we program and control through MIDI and patch the audio back through the mixing board. But now I still use those, but now the heart of the activity is all inside the computer in terms of sound manipulation and pr of production and manipulation. And so it's uh, incredibly rich and deep capabilities are presented by the computer now, which are capabilities we never had before. One instance of Omnisphere, which is a virtual synthesizer, can play 32 different synthesizer programs at the same time. So I can push, you know, I can play a C major chord, a triad, C, E, and G, and have 32 different synthesizers responding to that in completely different ways. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's like, that's like if you're standing in front of the orchestra and you say, okay, everybody play a C, right? But, you know, there's the first violins, the seconds, the violas, the cellos, the basses, the flutes, the clarinets, the, the French horns, the timpani. Everybody plays their version of a C. It's pretty powerful, <laughs> that one note, right? Because you've got, you know, 100 men and women playing one note. That's powerful. Are you so familiar with all the instruments and all the sounds and the tones and the timbres that you are so instinctively able to reach for these sounds? Is that something that you have such a vocabulary of timbre and tone in your palate, in your head, that you can just, you know, it, it's so quick for you? That's a really great question because it's a, it's the very heart of what I focus on. You, you you hit the nail on the head. You know, I'm always looking, I'm always playing with the timbral aspects of what is already known. In other words, um, let's say on the Grace album, I developed a pad that uses um, 12 different synthesizers. So when I play the chords, let's say I play a C in the right hand, and in the left hand, I play octave Fs. So it's a, a C, C over an F, which is like a sus kind of a feel. It's kind of an, you know, it's a floating kind of a magical chord. But now, let's say, you know, the, the pinnacle of where I, I got that pad on the Grace album, that's like the starting point. When I go to work on mindfulness, I have that available. I can call that up in Omnisphere and I can turn on all the outboard synthesizers and get right back to where I was. But now I'm like, well, I want to take that somewhere a little different. I want to take it further or make it more interesting to me. And so I'll start fussing with, well, what if I change this synthesizer in this way? And so in terms of 
vocabulary, I, I think of like warmer, deeper, more euphoric. Um, uh, there, it's hard to put it into words. It's something more that I, I fuss with it until it feels right, you know, until it, it gives me that feeling of contented equanimity, you know, a feeling of uh, being in deep meditation or, you know, a very satisfying oral landscape. So, yeah, it's 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 interesting that the words um, can often fail, which of course is why we do music <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, music is so much more eloquent than words. <laughs> and well, I really hope that my audience, when they listen to grace or mindfulness or bhakti, they really look out for these things to listen to the, really listen to the, the nice gradations and nuance of what's happening because it is really fascinating and really wonderful to now the fact that you're saying it makes me want to after this interview jump on and listen again to the album and have another second take yeah that that's one of my goals when i'm working is i want to make the production rich enough and nuanced enough so that if you listen to it 10 years from now or 20 years from now it will it will reveal some more charms or offer you some more gifts that you didn't notice the first time uh, that's a big part of my process. I'm, you know, it's like, how many angels can I get dancing on the head of this pin? You know, I'm always, yeah. So I turn this down a little, I turn this up a little, Oh, turn that down a little more, make this a little warmer, cut 1000 here, cut 2000 here. I'm talking about equalization and frequencies, um, <clears throat> compress this sound a little more <clears throat> because it's sticking out too much. Um, <clears throat> pan this sound a little more to the left so it doesn't conflict with this sound take this sound over here and put it through a flanger and put that through a delay and then send that into a big reverb but now that's too loud so you got to turn that down put a stereo expander on this because it needs to come outside of the speakers it's too much in the center and on and on and on and on and you're talking about several thousand of these decisions going on every session every session of uh, explorations try this try that you are based you're self-taught did you teach yourself all these technical terms and did you did you read a, a manual did you have a friend a producer friend who helped you with any of this or how did you teach yourself yeah i'm, I'm self-taught and i think that i it took me a little longer to learn the technical side of it because i was self-taught and i I wasn't able to get an apprenticeship in a big studio and I didn't live in the city where there were big studios to go to. And so I, I did have to teach myself. So it took a little longer to get where I needed to get. But, yeah, it doesn't matter. I think as long as you get there, that's the important thing. Now, compositionally, you've said in an interview, the feeling drives you. And so if you hit a chord that you don't know classically how to analyze it, it just happens. Can you take me through a, a compositional, not so much the production, but the chords? Do you like quiet everything down and just play around with a keyboard? What is your main modality for composition? That's a great question. Yeah, I would say it depends on the kind of piece. So um, if you take a piece like Well of Souls, it's on Muse of the Round Sky. It came out in 1990. Um, that one... I was visiting a friend and I came home and I was in a good mood. I was, I felt joyful that I had a friend, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> life was good. And uh, <clears throat> I sat down at the keyboard and I turned on the MIDI recorder and I just started improvising. And out came this piece, the chord progression from Well of Souls. And it was very mysterious and haunting and magical and complicated. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And after I got done, you know, with the excitement of building up the track, the basic track, I went back and I tried to analyze it, you know, and say, well, what chords are those? And after the very first chord, I couldn't analyze them. It was beyond my my um, my knowledge. It was it was basically Wagnerian chromatic harmony, which is that kind of harmony that borders on the atonal, but it just keeps from going over the edge, but it was very chromatic. And so each chord was so complicated, I couldn't analyze it. But, but you know, I always tell people this. I say, go with your, your heart, your gut. Don't, don't 
try to think music, just feel it. Because if you just let your fingers wander around the keyboard with uh, surrendered awareness, in other words, I, I surrender to a higher power, play through me, sing through me, come through me, use this body, use these fingers to make some beautiful music, you would come up with some amazing colors and textures which are way beyond definition. You know, it's like a six note chord. You can't give it a name. Well, it's a C major seven with an add two, add four, flat five. It's like, you know, it, does, it doesn't mean anything anymore, the words. <laughs> so you don't think <laughs> like that the, then? So for you, those, those analyses no, I, I, is not a part of your compositional process. Right, most of the time, except right now, see, I'm doing a very traditional uh, more pop type devotional album. And so the chord progressions need to be comfortable to the average listener. So I'm deliberately thinking, okay, I'm in C major. What are my options? Okay, I've got the F, the G, the D minor, the A minor. You know, these are my basic chords, my one, my five, my four, my two, my six. And so I'm thinking, you know, much more practical, much more simple and accessible so, see, it depends on the job, you know, on the work. This album, I don't want it to be too deep in terms of harmonic language. It's more of a groovy, fun, happy album with fun rhythms, and you can dance to it, and it's, it's a completely different animal than Well of Souls. So you have to bring the technique to the project that's appropriate. You know, if you if you use the wrong technique, you know, it's like using a chainsaw to brush your teeth. You know, oh. it's, a, it, yeah, it's a great tool, but it's not meant for that. Or it's like trying to try to cut a tree down with a toothbrush. You know, it's, 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 it's not going to work very well. <laughs> now, for new listeners who are interested in you, can you recommend starting points for them? Any pieces that you'd like to highlight for new listeners who are very interested in your work? Well, I think it's uh, letting your heart guide you. You know, uh, if you like the um, the deep electronic space music, it's healing spaces. You might like uh, mindfulness and grace and bliss and love and albums like that. Or if you like the world music vibe, you might like Garden of Delight or um, Bhakti and uh, – you know, but my website, roundskymusic.com, is a good resource, a starting point, uh, R-O-U-N-D-S-K-Y music, roundskymusic.com. And, of course, uh, Spotify, places like that, you can hear all my catalog in there, uh, Avgerinos, A-V-G-E-R-I-N-O-S, Paul Avgerinos. And uh, what you mentioned, an upcoming project that you were creating for this year? Yeah. Well, I have uh, I have two projects. So one coming out in March, which is exciting, is with, again with Deepak Chopra. This is the 25th year anniversary of his famous book, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, which is you know one of the most beloved New Age books and the most uh, successful uh, books of all time. The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. So we're doing uh, musical meditations on the Seven Spiritual Laws. That's coming out March 21st, first day of spring. And then my um, the album I'm working on right now, I'm hoping for August, September. And that's going to fish, uh, feature Krishna Das, the uh, amazing kirtan singer. And, and uh, <clears throat> this is going to be a fun album. It's uh, danceable and upbeat. The idea is that, you know, there's a lot of great devotional music. And there's a lot of great up dance music for exercising and, you know, being active, but there's not music that's danceable and devotional. So, you know, so if you want to work out, but you don't want to listen to, you know, club music, you want to hear something a little more spiritually uplifting, that this album will fit the bill. So it's, uh, you know, uh, we're always looking for albums that, fulfill a need we look we we look at the what's out there and we say well what 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 is not being offered to people that they could find useful and um you know that's what good producers do because you know you don't want to make the same album that there's a thousand of that already you want to make something that 
is, is uh, fulfilling a need. You know, you think of uh, a great producer told me many years ago, he said, Paul, before you make an album, answer three questions. Who's going to listen to this album? What are they going to be doing while they're listening to it? And how is it going to serve them? And he said, if you don't know the answer to those three questions, you're not ready to start yet. And you should not start yet because you're just going to make a mumbo jumbo, right? Because you don't have a style guide. You got to have a style guide. You have to have a vision, a 30,000 foot vision of what's this album? What is it? Is it a cat, a dog, a rabbit, a carrot, cauliflower? What is this thing you're making? And who is it going to serve? Very important. Hey, God bless Brian Keene for teaching me that. He told me that about 20 years ago, and it took me 10 years to implement it. Because <laughs> that, that's how it works with great teachings, you know. Yeah. They, they can tell you something in one sentence, but it might take you 20 years or all of your life to try to implement it, you know. Well, I can't wait to hear your, your upcoming albums, Paul. And it's really been a pleasure to talk to you. And let's end off on a final question, Paul. Can you give any advice to a young musician who is interested in being a part of the music industry and just share some advice that you have for a young person. Yes, well, I would say the most important thing is to work as hard as you possibly can while remaining humble and open to whatever possibilities the universe brings. So you may have it in your heart to be a great jazz musician, but you're offered a job in a reggae band. Don't turn it down because that might lead to something else which ends up fulfilling your heart's desire. The universe is mysterious. And the, you know, often the, the, the way we go somewhere is not the straight route. It's a circuitous, you know, we go in a wave-like motion. So you have to be very humble and hardworking and open-minded because the universe wants to fulfill your desire, but the more flexible you are, the more chances the universe has to help you. So you explore all the options, you know, you make, you call all the people, you try all the jobs in that, that subgenre or whatever, you know, uh, it's all about staying the course and showing up, you know, you have to, you have to keep showing up and making your best effort, even when things are not going well. If, if you're going through a frustrating period, you have to have a long-term vision, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, don't expect things to happen overnight. You might get some, some unsurprise, you might get some surprising success quickly, but you may instead have a, more of a slow burn, which is what most of us experience. So at the end of the day, it's about following your heart and working very hard. Thank you for that, Paul. That was really wonderful. And I, I hope you had a good time in the interview as I really, really enjoyed this one. Oh, uh, this has been one of my favorite ever. Uh, thank you so much for doing so much research and being so knowledgeable and prepared. I, I think you're amazing. To you, If everyone did as great a job as you, we'd have even much better interviews. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Paul. Well, Paul, I hope to have you back when your next album is released. We can chat some more. And thanks again so much for this interview and have a great rest of the day. My pleasure, Nikhil, and the same to you. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for listening to today's episode of The Nikhil Hogan Show with the great Paul F. Gerinos. It really gave me a greater appreciation for other styles of music and some new perspectives. If you're liking the show, become a supporting listener on Patreon for free goodies and access to our private Facebook group. Finally, get on the mailing list at NikhilHogan.com. I'm going to be putting up free music tutorial ebooks that are designed to be easy to understand for everyone and really useful. Thanks again, and I'll see you at the next show. 